Verse number 49, Atta Visati Buddha Vandana, salutation to the 28 Buddhas. First we are going to pay homage to 28 Buddhas who appear in this world. When Rara and Mahindo is here, I always get the chance to relax. <laughs> so after that Rara and Mahindo will continue. Please stand up. Vande Tanham Karam Buddham Vande Tanham Karam Buddham Vande Medham Karam Munin Saranankarang munin vande Saranankarang munin vande Deepankarang jinang name Deepankarang jinang name Vande kondanya sattarang Vande kondanya sattarang Vande mang Sumana Sambuddham Vande Sumana Sambuddham Vande Revata Nayakam Vande Revata Nayakam Vande Sumita Vande Sobita Sambuddham Vande Sobita Sambuddham Ano Madasi Munin Nami Madasi Munin Nami Vande Padum Sambuddham Vande Padum Sambuddham Vande Narad Nayakam Vande Narad Nayakam Padum Uttarang Munin Vande Sumedha Nayakam Vande Sumedha Nayakam Vande Sujata Sambuddham Vande Sujata Sambuddham Piyadasi Munin Nami Piyadasi Munin Nami Atadasi Munin Vande Dhammadasi jinam nami Dhammadasi jinam nami Vande siddhat sattaram Vande siddhat sattaram Vande tis mahamunin Vande tis mahamunin Vande pus mahavira Sikhi Mahamunin Vande Vande Vesadhu Nayakam Kaku Sandang Munin Vande Kassapang Sugatam Vande Kassapang Sugatam Vande Vande Gotam Nayakam Vande Gotam Nayakam Atta Visati Me 
the word Samma means full, perfectly, fully or perfectly. Some Buddha, that prefix some, gives the idea that the Buddha perfected himself through his own efforts by oneself. So a Samma Sam Buddha is one who has perfected his certain virtues and gained that enlightenment through his own efforts. Without the effort, without the aid of any external beings, but he gained his enlightenment through his own efforts. Such a one is a Samma Sambuddha. After having perfected for many lives certain virtues that which we call parami or paramitas. We speak of the ten paramitas or sometimes the Sanskrit version speaks of the six paramitas but when you expand that six you can get the ten paramitas. What are these ten paramitas? The ten perfections. Dana. Dana. Giving. Perfection of giving. Charity. How you give. How you perfect giving. Different people have different stages of development, different understanding about giving. Some people like to give things, but they only give things which they do not want, or things that they cannot eat, that they cannot use, that they give. One kind of giving, it's also a giving. Some people practice a little bit better than that. That uh, they are prepared to give whatever they see is useful. And whatever they are using or whatever they eat, whatever they use, they are prepared to give that to others. So in case they only eat porridge and uh, some tau yu or some sauce and uh, kiam china, they are only prepared to give others that. Anyway, they are prepared to give them what they like to eat. There are other people who practice giving at another level at a higher level. They are prepared to give some things which they don't normally use, which they don't normally eat, they don't normally use, but when they see that some others, some people, they need it, they have greater need for some other things, they are prepared to buy, they are prepared to offer those things. In other words, even though they may lead very simple, very frugal lives, but when it comes to giving and sharing others, they are prepared to 
pen like a prince to give others to their satisfaction according to their needs that is another way better way of giving but here when we talk about the perfection of giving we can see different degrees of giving we give material things such as food clothing shelter medicine and various other things material things that we are prepared to give some are still not prepared to give those material things but if we want to cultivate these virtues then we should be prepared to give up this material possessions little by little and then uh, eventually another degree of giving not only material things not only our material possessions but also our bodily possession something from this body which can help others which can serve prolong others life or which can benefit others in other words one who is perfecting this virtue of giving he is prepared to share what we he has within this body such as what many of you are also doing on certain occasions when the temple and the various organizations here promote blood donation campaign giving of blood and later on sometimes you have pledging your kidneys and other tissues such as your eye organ for others now the buddha in his past lives he had practiced this virtue he had given up in fact once he was born as a king as a bodhisattva one who is perfecting his virtues to become an all enlightened being to become a samasambuddha as when he was born into a royal family and eventually became a king king sivi he has given had given his eyes to the servant who was blind and uh, the books in the jataka you find in the birth stories of the buddha the buddha the past lives how he had summoned he had called the surgeon surgeon and to remove his eyes and give eyes to the blind so you can see that this transplant of tissues tissue transplant is not really something new and uh, the buddha lived more than 2500 years ago but as a bodhisattva as he was perfecting these virtues he was not even a buddha at that time that means more many more thousand years ago perhaps they may have some other techniques of how they can take out they can uh, transplant tissues and limbs also 
So, so when we understand this teaching, we can see how the donation of tissues, the donation of organs, there is no question whatsoever about whether it is uh, a Buddhist, whether we can promote it or not, whether we should promote it or not. Uh, it is the life, uh, the life in the life and the teachings of the Buddha very clearly mentioned. That's the second degree of giving. Giving something, the bodily possession. And the highest form of giving is the gift, the sacrifice of one's life. At the expense of one's own life, that being is prepared to save others' lives, or for the welfare, for the benefit of others. And there's also another story of how, as a Bodhisattva, when he was born as a prince into another royal family, he had gone one day, he had gone to the forest, to the jungle, on a hunting trip with his other brothers. And he had seen, he saw a tigress, a female tiger, with a few liters, a few cups, baby tiger. And the mother tigress could not move, was very thin, very weak, because she had not eaten for a long time. And this little baby, they were just taking the milk from her. And then, as the princess, as all his brothers, moved on, this prince, Bodhisattva prince, he saw the sight, the pitiable sight of the female tiger, the tigress and her cubs. He took pity on them and he felt, my life is only one, but the lives of this being. There are few of them there. What can I give? What can I offer? Now, he was at that stage of practicing to his perfection of giving and he was prepared to give his life. So, he waited until all his brothers left the forest and he climbed up the rock and thought, how can he help these creatures? And moved by compassion, he jumped down so that his body he offered his body to that tigress so that the tigress can have something to eat because if the tigress do not have anything to eat, soon she will die. When she die, all her cubs will also die. So that was the story of the Bodhisattva, how he perfected his virtue this virtue of dana, giving even his life to save others. We 
may see this story and uh, many people may think that where is the wisdom of this man, of this prince, this bodhisattva? No. Here, the bodhisattva was practicing this particular virtue, this particular principle of giving to its perfection. Others may think he's a very foolish person. Just like all of you here, you sacrifice your time watching the there may be good program on today, now, in the television. So many people back home in your, some members of your family say, Why, Papa, why do you want to go to temple every Friday night? There are some good programs here. Huh? And some of your friends also say, You know, Friday night is the only night that you know you can stay late. You can enjoy, but you do not you know how to enjoy. You go to temple and you sit down only. Huh? Yeah. So, but you see there are different practices, different levels of understanding. You who have come here, who have faith and confidence in the Dhamma, in the teachings, it is through your faith, your confidence that brings you. And so your practice is different. You don't worry what other people say. So some people may say that you're very stupid too. Why many other people say we are very stupid. We do not know how to enjoy our lives. So when one is practicing certain virtues and determined, have made certain strong determination to practice that virtue. Sometimes his actions appears to be unbiased, but there are certain principles that person uphold. That is the way how one practices this virtue to its perfection. And when he has completed that particular virtue, you can see such a being, when such a being is born, that being, according to the law of karma, according to the law of cause and effect, such a being will be born in a position where he has everything and more what the world has to offer because he has given up those things and he gets in return. And even that he does not cling to, he is prepared to give up that for some higher values of life. So, the last Buddha, the last historical Buddha, Gautama the Buddha, had practiced these virtues. And all the past Buddhas, the Buddha mentioned of Buddhas in the past. But from our Buddhist tradition, we maintain this tradition of the 28 Buddhas. Why only 28? There are many others in the past. Right? Why 28 Buddhas? Why not 1,000 Buddhas? There are some temples that say 1,000 Buddha temple huh? and 10,000 Buddhas too. Huh? Well, different period, during different period of Buddhism, there have 
certain practices or certain worship, certain uh, uh, methods of prayer or worship were popular at certain stage. Now, during the time of the Buddha, there were also another religion, Jainism. And Jainism, the founder of, or rather, the leader of Jainism, we cannot say really founder of Jainism, just as we cannot say founder of Buddhism. Why? Because there had been Buddhas in the past. There had been past founders. The Buddha only rediscover the nature of things. Then, in Jainism, the leader, a contemporary of Gautama the Buddha, his name was Niganda Nata Buddha, and he was popularly known as Lord Mahavira, just as people call the Buddha Lord Buddha, Buddha Bhagavan. Also, people call Lord Mahavira. He was an elder contemporary of the Buddha. And his followers, he said to be the 28th Tirtankara, 28th Tisha pass, from that pass. So, it is possible that from this, because Jainism was very popular at that time, and Buddhism was, came up, the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha was teaching when there was Jainism and other religions at that time. And through the influence, you know how one religion influences another religion. And that is how, how the Buddhist practice came to be and came 28 Buddhas by name were recorded like that. There may be other reasons also, but this could be one reason how the Buddhists maintain the tradition of the 28 Buddhas when the other names are not remembered. However, when we recall to mind, each time we recall to mind of the Buddhas, these Buddhas that we recall to mind are the Sammasam Buddhas. They are the fully enlightened Buddhas. So, if we know how to reflect on the Buddha, the virtues, the qualities of the Buddha, immediately when we think of the Buddha, we can get a lot of inspiration. Why? Because as Buddhists, by definition, a Buddhist is one who goes for refuge to the Buddha. That's why when on various occasions you recite Buddha Saranam Gachami, you go for refuge to the Buddha. Every time you think of the virtues of the Buddha, what happens? What happens to your mind? When you think of the great virtues of the Buddha, then good thoughts, they are good thoughts in your mind. And these good thoughts helps to calm down your mind, help to compose and stabilize your mind. And that's why there is a meditation. And this meditation is useful for all the contemplation 
or reflection on the virtues of the Buddha. Like when you recite Iti Piso Bhagava Araham Samma Sambuddho and so on. The nine virtues or great qualities of the Buddha. Reflect that again and again. But when you have no time, when you have little time, you can just try to reflect on one virtue, just one great virtue. Like if you want to develop your loving kindness, develop metta, then you just think of the great loving kindness or you think of the great compassion of the Buddha and you develop that virtue just when you think of the great compassion of the Buddha your mind focus on that compassion and just think how great because it is through the compassion of the Buddha that he practiced he sacrificed many lives life after life and sacrificed his life to practice these different virtues to develop various skills various skills so that he can teach so that he know how to enlighten the minds of beings not only human beings but also other beings that's why we call the Buddha a teacher of gods and men the Buddha became a teacher of gods and men not just in one lifetime but from many lives he sacrificed his life through what? through compassion through compassion and it is through compassion that the Buddha perfected his virtues, his paramis, perfections it is through wisdom that the Buddha purified his mind purified his own mind and he knows the way how others can purify their mind too through wisdom the Buddha was the great embodiment of wisdom and compassion these two great virtues whilst the virtue of compassion motivate us to help others the virtue of wisdom will motivate us to help ourselves too, to purify our minds. The more pure we become, the greater the service that we would be able to render, to give to others. So when we contemplate these virtues, naturally our mind can absorb these virtues when our mind become absorbed in these virtues our mind we can feel in our body in our mind that calmness and when we saturate our mind with this thought of compassion we are actually saturating our mind with the thought that all beings be free from suffering because compassion is that thought the thought when you see other beings suffering you have the good wish that they be free from suffering that is compassion so when you saturate yourself and then radiate out you can radiate out this thought that all beings be free from suffering first it must happen at the level of the mind the thought when you start cultivating this thought more and more then when you see suffering beings when you see how people suffer various kinds of problems, various kinds of sickness then 
there will be the strong urge in you to want to help them. And that will motivate you to practice and how you can help them. Sometimes, if your knowledge, your skill is limited, you cannot help many people. But when your compassion, you have more compassion, you develop your compassion more, then naturally that will condition you, that will motivate you to develop more, to make your mind stronger so that you can help more people. And that is how. And true compassion, when you want to help others, you will think of different ways, different means of helping others. And you will see, the more you help others, the more opportunity you will have to see the unsatisfactory nature of life. If you only live under the roof of your own house, your own home, you may see some suffering. Your parents, your grandparents, or your children, or your brother, sister, or some relative, some suffering, some sickness, or some other misfortune, but they are just within your family. You think, sometimes you think they are terrible, they suffer so much like that. You have not gone outside your home to see how other people. When you begin to join in and join with the other members to go out, to the old folk home, huh? you see, to the hospital and to other places, then you begin to see. And when you see how people live and how much suffering they have, then your suffering is nothing compared to others. And not only that, when you help other people, when they are sick, when they are in trouble, you take the trouble, you sacrifice your time, your energy, your money to help them. Then, if you want to help them, you try in various ways what you have learned then you try to advise them. But sometimes they cannot take that advice. You talk to them, like for example, you go back and try, when you appreciate the Dhamma, you want to try to bring your parents, you want to try to bring the other members of your family, like your children, but they don't want to listen to you. They turn a deaf ear to you. Or sometimes they get angry when you talk to them. You must do like this, like this, like this. So, you do it out of good intention. You have compassion for them. But, you have not hit them at the right frequency, at the right wavelength. So you have, if you want to help them, then you come. Sometimes you try in your own way, you cannot. So you come and ask, Chief Reverend, you come and uh, discuss with some other friends, how can I help? I try this way already. And then somebody may suggest to you, there is another way. You, why not you try another way? So you keep on trying different ways until you hit the right way. And that is how you try, develop different skills to help different people. Sometimes they cannot respond to your words, 
Dhamma in words, but they can respond to your action, your kind action. And when they are in trouble, you don't preach to them. Some people, when you preach to them, they are very receptive. Some people are not receptive with preaching. But you give your help, you render them their help. And after that, they start to have faith and confidence in you. And they want to listen to you. And then you can open their minds after that. So, after that you will learn that there are different people who have different nature. And their sufferings have different causes. Have different causes. Why they suffer? In order to help them, you must try to find out why are they suffering. And then you begin to learn the cause of the suffering. And this is what? With compassion, with your motivation to help others, you begin to see little by little, wisdom will dawn in your mind. You begin to see suffering more and begin to understand the real cause of suffering. You see how people, as long as they have attachment, the more attachment they have to things, the more clinging they have to their body, to themselves, to others, to their things, the more they suffer. And that's how you understand the law, the noble truth of suffering, the cause of suffering. Then you begin to see how some people are able to end the suffering. How some people have less suffering because they have less attachment. And you see how some people lead a good life. They are virtuous. They have good conduct. They don't kill, they don't steal. They don't have sexual misconduct. They don't lie. And they don't indulge in intoxicants. Their life, they have good life, they have calm, they have more peace of mind. Then you get the confidence, this must be the way, like that. So by helping different people, it will open up your mind. These two virtues, wisdom and compassion, they reinforce one another. When you develop, when you start to have compassion, that compassion will condition you to begin to see suffering and see the cause of suffering. The way, the end and the way that leads to the end. When wisdom arises in your mind, you will naturally have compassion too. Because what is wisdom? Wisdom is right understanding, right? Right thoughts. When you have right understanding, you have understanding of law of karma, cause and effect. You have understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So wisdom, one part of wisdom is that. Wisdom is not only, not only just knowledge, but the knowledge with compassion, with the knowledge of the true nature of life and have compassion. So the Buddha, besides other great virtues, the Buddha was an embodiment of this virtue. If we can think of the Buddha, and when we think of the Buddha, we think of these virtues, we will have that inspiration to practice. If we can think of the Buddha, and when we think of the Buddha, we think of these virtues, we will have that inspiration to practice. And when we get that kind of inspiration, the faith which grows in us, it will condition energy to arise in our mind, to make our mind strong. With that energy, 
we can divert, direct our mind to develop effort, the right effort. The four kinds of right effort, the effort to prevent bad thoughts, unwholesome thoughts from arising in the mind. We need effort to prevent it. We need effort in case some bad thoughts have arisen. We need another kind of effort to overcome it. The effort to maintain the goodness that is already in our mind and the effort to develop to cultivate the good that is not there. This kind of effort, we need energy, the mental energy. Not only physical energy, but it's a mental energy. And then we use this effort to, when there is effort, there is, it will condition mindfulness, awareness to arise. Sati or mindfulness. And that mindfulness will in turn condition concentration to arise. And that concentration will condition cons- wisdom to arise. So you can see how when we have the in the Buddha, by reciting the names of the Buddha, it will instill in us a kind of faith in the Buddha. And then, when there is faith in the Buddha, that faith naturally conditions energy to arise. And then in turn it conditions effort, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. These five mental faculties And that's how you develop the power of your mind. They are the faculties of your mind in the sense that the mind has the ability, the potentiality to develop these things. And when you develop them rightly, your mind will become more balanced, more stable. For if you have faith alone, but you don't have wisdom, that's what you call blind faith can lead you to a lot of trouble. You have concentration, you have no awareness. Your concentration, you can become like a stone, like a tree. You can just, your mind, you can concentrate on something, but you have no right awareness, no right mindfulness. Wisdom still don't arise in you. You have a lot of effort, you put in a lot of effort, a lot of energy, but you don't have proper concentration. Your mind will have a lot of restlessness, many thoughts in your mind. So when these faculties are properly developed in the mind, your mind will become more balanced. And when your mind is balanced, whatever you do become more balanced. You don't go to the extreme of things. But in the process of developing of our mind, we tend to develop certain faculty more than the other. And that is why we tend to go a little extreme sometimes. But always, if we can reflect, if we can reflect and know great virtues of the Buddha, then immediately that will give the faith and other virtues will be conditioned to arise. Then we can balance our mind. So, the faith and confidence is very important virtue. When you recite these verses with faith, with confidence, it will give you a lot of energy, a lot of energy. Even though you are tired, even though you have some problem, some sickness, you know, when people have faith, when they concentrate on the Buddha, and then they get this energy, they can divert this energy to other parts of their body to calm down themselves, 
and when they calm down themselves, this energy can force through certain blockages because our whole mind and body, we are only made up of energy. Our whole being is nothing but a system of energy, what today some people call some field of force, force field, like that. It is because if there is something wrong in the mind, some defiling tendency arises in the mind, then tension arises, and that tension in the mind conditions the body, and then blockages are energy blockages. So if we know how to arouse this energy to come up in our mind. And then we try to purify this energy and vibrate it in the right frequency so that our body can relax. Then this is how people talk about faith healing. Faith healing, why? Those people who have the ability to arouse faith and confidence in the minds of other people. Even blind faith can heal, but blind faith cannot lead you to the real wisdom to be free from all suffering. It can help you temporary, temporary healing can, can cure your hand, can cure your leg, can cure your back ache. But if you have no wisdom, your mind is not balanced, next week again you get back egg too. That is the nature. As long as we do not have the real wisdom, we are still subject to birth, old age, sickness and death. As long as we are born, we have this old age, sickness and death. It is only through the real understanding of Understanding the sublime teachings of the Buddha. Because all the Buddhas teach the same thing. All Buddhas, that's why the Buddha summarizes his teaching and says, Sapa papa sa akaranang kusalasa upasampada, sa chitta pariyoda panang etam buddhanu sasanang. Buddha said, Sabda-papa-sahakarana, avoid all forms of evil, unwholesome action. Kusalasa-upasambada, cultivate the good. sachitta paryodapana purify one's own mind. etam buddhana sasana This is the teachings of all the Buddhas, all the Buddhas. All the 28 Buddhas that you mentioned just now and many more other Buddhas all teach the same thing. But their teachings sometimes may not be long, understand? May not be so clear. Because different Buddhas appearing at different times, it is said again according to the commentaries, according to the tradition, it is said that certain period, certain world cycle, certain Buddhas appear. One Buddha, two Buddha may appear, but certain world cycle, maybe no Buddha appear in that world cycle. In our case, we are born at this time of, at this point of time, in this world cycle, when we are fortunate. There is Buddha. And the tradition say that in the world cycle that we live in, there will be five Buddha. Five. Huh? Four already passed. The last one was Gautama the Buddha. The teachings of Gautama the Buddha of the effort and the 
wisdom that the Buddha, when he, as a Bodhisattva, he practiced that. And he gained his enlightenment to those qualities. His teaching lasts longer, longer. Now more than 2,500 years ago, more than 2,500 years ago, still, we can still learn and practice the true teachings of the Buddha. But slowly, little by little, the minds of men will become clouded. Because now, many people like shortcut. They don't like to practice very hard. They like the shortcut. Many people come to temple. What do they want? They want quick blessing for prosperity. Quickly they want, give something. If you can bless this water for me and I drink and my sickness all gone. Or if you can give me something, you can bless this Buddha and I use and my business will prosper so that you know I don't have to work so hard huh? and uh, everybody will listen to me I can control them that's why some people put one Buddha not one Buddha they put many Buddhas and then they put in how many Buddha sometimes seven Buddha Monday to Sunday you see one Buddha for Monday, two, another second Buddha for Tuesday. You have seen some temple have Monday Buddha, Tuesday Buddha, and so on. Right? So some people actually wear many Buddhas. I have seen some of them. Some of them have 12 Buddha. One Buddha, one man. <laughs> and maybe after you learn this, you try to put 28 Buddhas on you for protection. No. You want to know how, what is, how you can derive the real protection from the Buddha. Listen, this is what the Buddha said. Dhammo hawi rakati dhammajari, the Buddha said. The real protection comes from where? Not from the image, not from the picture. But the picture, the image is useful for you to direct your mind, for you to focus your mind so that your mind can become strong. And when your mind becomes calm and peaceful, then all the good dharmas will arise in you. Because if you have calm, peaceful mind, everything you do will be good will be better. If people talk bad about you also, good, because your mind is calm. Your mind is peaceful. If people give you some food and, uh, you know, not so good smell, not so tasty, when you eat, if your mind is good, it's good too. But if your mind is not good, even very tasty food also, not very you can find fault with them. Even some people do some good thing also, you can find fault with them. If your mind is not good. You see, when you are in the office or at home, when you get upset in your mind, little bit, little bit, maybe your child or you know, your brothers, sisters, shout and make a little bit of noise. You get very angry with them. Hmm? But when you are happy, they shout and they yell and they break things, you still smile. <laughs> it's good like that. You don't care, you don't shout at them. Why? Because your mind is good. So if we can see this thing, we should try eventually 
to make our mind good as much as possible. How to make our mind good? Calm down. Calmness, tranquility is important. It is where there is tranquility, many good things will arise. We can see many things clearer for ourselves. We can see our nature better when our mind is calm and peaceful. So you can do this thing when you have faith and confidence. The Buddha said, you want to see the real Buddha? Where is the real Buddha? Huh? How can you see the Buddha? Some people say, Buddha is no more already. He passed away already 2,500 years ago. So where is the Buddha? The Buddha said, Yo dhammang pasati so mang pasati, Buddha says. Uh, he who sees the Dhamma sees me. If you want to see the real Buddha, where is the real Buddha? The real Buddha you can see in the Dhamma, in the teachings of the Buddha. In the Dhamma, how do you see the Dhamma? When you practice the Dhamma. When you practice the Dhamma and you experience and you can verify the teaching for yourself, that's how you really see the Dhamma. And when you really see the Dhamma, then you can see the Buddha. You can understand the Buddha mind. It is not outside, it is inside. So, but we start with the Buddha. That's why we always, we go for refuge to the Buddha. When we go for refuge to the Buddha, we are going for refuge to his Dhamma. But how do we know the Dhamma? That's where we go for refuge to the Sangha. The noble, the faithful noble ones who have been trained, who have been well trained, then we go for refuge to them. That's how we can receive the Dhamma. Well, and by receiving the Dhamma, we can see the Buddha well, clearer. Buddha. This the Buddha gave his teaching. So you can contemplate on this thing again as you recite, after you have recited. The recital, all these recitals are very useful because in our life, if we want to discipline ourselves, then we should Establish some kind of routine. And this is what you call the religious routine. We should take some time in the morning, some time in the evening, that we can spend some time. The recital of the suttas helps us to understand the teachings better and to keep the teaching in our mind. Why people chant this suttas? Of course, many people today, if they don't understand the teaching, they say it has magic, has power. True, it has power. But people don't understand where the power come from. When you, the sound has power when you recite. And that's why some people say, oh, why must we recite in Pali? Why can't we recite in Bahasa Malaysia? Or in, the, why can't we say in English? You know, there are different sounds. And some sounds in the ancient time, 
the monks have composed it in such a way that it produces a certain kind of rhythm. And that rhythm, that sound, that vibration has certain effect that can give harmony. You? It is different. But there are, if you, if you develop, if you develop certain language and you follow the sound, follow the pitch, follow the this thing, you can produce some effect too. But that language is useful. If you use some other language, it's useful for you to know what it is about. But still, the ancient language, the old religious language, is useful to maintain because it has been used for a long time. And uh, the minds, the vibration it produces, not only that, because certain words cannot be fully translated into other words, you see. Uh, so we can retain the real meaning of it. Then, when we recite something, our mind, we keep our mind at that object when we recite, we develop our concentration. So it is a form of meditation. And then, when our mind becomes calm, and then we recite these things, we want, we wish others well and happy. We wish, in the end, we say, Etena satcha vajena soti teho tu sapata. We say, by the truth of this verse, this teaching, may you be well, may you be happy. Now, this is a power in itself. You can test this yourself. When you are in difficulty, when you have problem, you can make this act of truth. But to make this act of truth, you can recall some goodness that you have done. Some goodness that you have done. When you, have, when you are confronted with certain crisis, certain problem in life, Think of your goodness. Think of some goodness that you have done. And determine. You can make your determination or adhishtana. By the power of this goodness, may I be able to overcome this crisis, this problem. But make sure you have a storehouse of virtues before you make that Determination. Otherwise, your determination is not strong. I know of monks who have good practice and when they determine to do something, the thing surely happens. If they want to help another person, when they just determine by their goodness, it happens. And when you can tame and train your mind more, when your mind becomes more purified, then you will know how to tap the pure energy of other beings, including your teachers and teachers' teacher. Why? The moment you begin to think of the goodness of your teacher, you think of the great qualities of your teacher, you get that energy. This is what you call, you can tap that energy. And then your mind becomes strong. When your mind is strong, you can radiate that energy too to others. Uh, so this is how good masters can have that power of the mind to help others. Sometimes not only through words, but through the wholesome radiation. Through that wholesome radiation. The metta, the loving kindness that they have for others for beings. Uh, this is how we learn how to uh, the act of truth, performing the act of truth by the truth of some wholesomeness, some good actions. Otherwise, 
you can learn this thing from the teachings and you have faith in the teaching by this truth may I be happy you can get see the result the power of metta loving kindness in this the power of truth or virtue all these things combined together can give that power that is why we can see and if you read the, if you read and learn the suttas you can see how we pray how an understanding buddhist should pray not only making a list and itemize please today i ask the buddha for this 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 one whole list you ask for this you ask for that and everything and maybe you prepare another list also when i get this i will give you that when i get this i will give you that when you help me to have good business and start good business i will donate a little bit for you you know if you give me more i will donate more for your building to come up quickly no this one is this is a carry forward of one's business habit uh, into religion but we don't laugh at others we all start with this thing when i was young i asked the buddha to i asked the buddha please help me let me pass my examination <laughs> you know huh? why and when i get angry my mother tell me you know you should learn to be patient i said how can i try and after some time i try to be patient but still anger come up then my mother tell me why don't you go and pray to the buddha i pray to the buddha i'll put a please make me more patient huh. and after that oh you know why every time i get angry i think of the buddha oh buddha when i think of the buddha the nimitta sometime the nimit come i remember once in my examination and i was very nervous very nervous sometimes cannot sleep in the night and then the nimitta the image of the buddha when i was young i used to go to certain temple to pray and that with the image very calm and very serene appear in my mind when that image appear you know my mind was calm peaceful i have confident i have confident because i think oh now the buddha help me now <laughs> no never mind but this is how we start our religious life you see this is how we start and after that when our mind is calm then we can concentrate we can learn we can read the dhamma we can practice more than the dhamma really we can become part and parcel of the dhamma then the dhamma really protect you why you don't need any other thing for protection if you have goodness in you your own virtues your own goodness will protect you if you work hard in your office and you are honest and trustworthy you have loving kindness for others people will love you and sometimes you may be late and your boss will not get angry with you too because you have very good record and he can close one eye sometimes he close both eyes too for you but why some people some of your colleagues some of your other colleagues when they come late the boss get very angry and scold them and sometimes fire them why because their work may not be good so what is it that has protected it is your virtue that protect you your virtue that protect you your virtue that can promote you can make you uh, 
whole high position in life. And when you are able, when you get that kind of promotion through your straightforwardness, through your honesty, through your virtues, when you get, when you climb to that position, you have happiness too. Some people try to work up, they climb up the ladder by hook or by crook. But when they get up to that position, they don't have the skill, they don't have the talent to deal with people. They do not know how to deal with people. And so their minds, they become very tense. And they worry too. They worry a lot. They are not happy. Work the right way up. And then you will see your real prosperity, the real good fortune will come to you. But first, start with the Buddha. The Buddha outside and the Buddha inside. What is the Buddha inside? when you have real awareness in your mind. When your mind can be more awakened and not go to sleep too much. In order to make our mind awake, then we have to sleep less so that we can be awake. Sometimes even in the night too we are awake. But if we sleep, Sometimes we sleep in the night, sleep in the morning. Difficult for the mind to be awakened, to be fully awakened, to know, we know, with the calm mind, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, what we think. When the mind is calm, the mind don't need to react to what we see. We just understand, we just know, but we can let go of that thing. But if the mind is not calm, it is difficult. We often react with it. That is why. So, your practice through your daily devotion is very useful. I started to have this daily routine when I was very young. Nobody taught me how to practice. But when I go to the temple, I hear other people recite Namo Tassa and five precepts and Iti Piso Bhagava and so on. Then I remember, I, while I was turning and tossing around on the bed, I was still trying to remember Namo Tassa Bhagava Tuharahato Samasamudasa. And not long after that, soon I was able to recite with the whole group like that. And it became day-to-day practice. And this practice, I substitute this practice with the traditional practice which my parents and grandparents taught me. My grandparents taught me when I was very young. Every day we have the traditional offering. We have the different deity. We have Kwan Ti, Chu Chong, Lo Ti, and other Devas, Deity. And then we offer tea, na? we offer tea. Chui Yi Chap Go offer many things too. Na? Burn paper and so on. And offer every day, morning and night, we offer incense and tea. Na? Then, after I come to know of the Buddhist practice, I substitute that, substitute that practice. And sometimes I can sit inside my room too and just recite that. And then go to school and come back like this. And I saw the value of this religious practice. It helps. It helps the family to become more peaceful and more harmony in the home. Why? Before you go to work, you should calm down your mind. In case you have bad experience, or in case 
You know, you have some problem, argument with the wife in the morning over breakfast table. Before you go to work, make sure you calm down your mind. If you want to calm down your mind, you go to the shrine, go where the Buddha is, look at the Buddha. When you look at the Buddha, you can calm down your mind. And after that, recite something. And then, when your mind is calm, happy, you go to office, you'll be happy there, or happier than before. And when you come back, in the office, after some time, you forget about the Buddha and Mara come. And then have problem and anger and all what, envy, jealousy and all these things come up before you go back home. And when you go back home, before you talk to your wife and children and parents, go to the Buddha first. In case you have a lot of problem, you want to talk to the Buddha, you can talk to Buddha because Buddha don't talk to other people. Your secrets, you don't reveal your secrets, so never mind. Why some people talk to the Buddha too, never mind. But some people say, no, Buddha gain enlightenment already, he cannot hear us. So that's why they go to Kuan Yin. So that's why many Chinese people have Kuan Yin, Kuan Si Yin, Posa, at least somebody who will listen to you. Because now very difficult to find trustworthy friends. Even relatives too, very difficult to trust them. So that's why we need somebody that we can trust. When you talk your problem up and then your mind becomes calm, you will be able to see the cause of the problem. And sometimes when your calmness of your mind, suddenly you get the thought, ah, it must be like this. You see the way. And you think, oh now, would they tell me? Kuan Yin tell me, or some deva come and tell me. No, your wisdom mind tell you. Your calm wisdom mind tell you. But sometimes others can come and tell you too, whatever it is. Okay, I think uh, it is about time now. And if you have one or two questions you like to ask, you can ask something. And uh, from what you have heard and what you, you know, have practice. Only when you practice will you have difficulty. If you have no question, that means you don't really, you have not really started to practice. Last time I was like you too. I listened to Dhamma, Chief Reverend give Dhamma talk a lot, and I listen. I don't ask any question because I have no problem. I have no problem because, you know, whatever I listen, good. No need but don't practice them. The real Dhamma, the real practice comes when you begin to confront your day-to-day -day life. Where there is anger, confront the anger. When you feel like wanting to sleep, don't sleep. When you feel like not wanting to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> when you feel like wanting to eat some more, don't eat some more. And when you don't want to eat at that time, you know, you eat. You don't like to eat some food, some medicine that you eat. <laughs> you confront the mind. That's how you make your mind strong. When you want to sit, you don't sit, you stand. When you want to lie down, you sit. <laughs> when your mind tells you something, you just confront. And until you know your mind, until you know your mind now, you know. Sometimes when you do that, then the Mara, you will know how the Mara comes to you. How your own defiling tendency come to you and tempt you and say, never mind, just a little while only, take rest a little while only, no problem. You take rest a little while and then after that go to sleep, forget about it. And when you sleep somewhere, you feel somewhere, you want to sleep somewhere, like that. And after that, people have to wake you up, you get angry. When you get angry, then have more problem for you. So condition your mind. Use your mind. Condition your mind before you go to sleep. Have good wish that all beings be well and happy. And then close your eyes. In case you cannot open it again, you, are, you have peaceful, you have done your job. Yes, eh? And that's why when you have the religious practice, 
And you say, Thaye na wacha chitte na. You ask for forgiveness for the Buddha. Not only the Buddha. It's only to teach you. You should have forgiveness. You should ask for forgiveness for your parents. Huh? And also children ask forgiveness for parents. And parents too should forgive and excuse what wrong children have done. Husband should forgive the wife. Wife should forgive husband before they go to sleep. Then they can sleep very peacefully. If you have still no guts, still have no courage to speak out, to ask for forgiveness, you do it in your mind first. When your mind is calm, then you just think, please, whatever wrong I have done to my teacher, to my parents, may they be forgive me. Whatever wrong others have done to me, may I to forgive them. And then after that, have metta loving kindness. And you go to sleep very peacefully. You can sleep soundly. No need tranquilizer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. Why people cannot sleep? Because they have a lot of thoughts in their mind. Because they have a lot of anger. Huh? Because they cannot agree with their parents. Why my father do like this? Uh, give so many things to my sister. I don't get. He cannot sleep. Why the boss do this thing to my colleague and, you know, not for me? I don't get this promotion, work so hard and you cannot sleep. Your mind keep on thinking, thinking, thinking. Free the mind and then you can sleep well. Okay, any more? Any question? No question then. If not, yes, you have one question. the different objects of veneration. Oh, that one I must ask Chief Raglan. <laughs> the sequence, I have. The transference of marriage. Page number 211. Please stand up. Punyan <laughs> Modana sharing of merits. There are three terms here, transference of merits, sharing of merits, and inviting others to share the merits. Usually, transference of merits, the word we use only for the departed. Sharing of merits, to all our relatives and friends, those who are ready to share the merits of the happiness. Inviting invisible living beings, devas and some others to share the merits. These are the three ways. Here in these recitals you can see we share the merits with our relatives and friends Again, we transfer the merits to our departed ones. Then we invite the devas. Here you can see we invite Brahma, Mara and Sakra. You know Brahma and Sakra very well. But we invite Mara also. Mara is the enemy of the Buddha and Buddhism. This is our Buddhist attitude. We invite our enemies also to come and share the happiness of the merits. So it clearly shows we do not harbor hatred or anger towards our enemies who disturb us. On the other hand, when we invite Mara to share the merits, the Mara won't come and disturb you anymore. The most interesting item is we invite Yama, the king of the hell, also to share the merit. It is very useful if you happen to go there, you can tell him, do you know, I always remember you and invited to share the merit, please may have some concession or omission. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you, these are very meaningful recitals for you to gain some confidence so please follow me word by word. 
Sam to Sabda Ever 